If you'll go ahead and make your way to Judges chapter 10 this morning, the book of Judges in chapter 10. My preaching professor, my preaching professor in Bible college used to say that you can always tell the first year students because they're the ones that know everything. Someone else has said that education is the process of expanding the borders of our ignorance. In other words, the more that I learn, the more that I realize how much I don't know. Our study of the book of Judges has led us to this 10th chapter where we begin to look at the recorded circumstances whereby we're introduced to Jephthah. Jephthah is the next judge in the list of judges that we've examined thus far. And while looking at these various judges, each one has its unique challenges, there's perhaps no account of a judge more perplexing than that of Jephthah's. If you're familiar with the story at the end of chapter 11, you know that Jephthah makes this vow, and there have been uh, debates over the years about what exactly does that mean. I've had three weeks to think about this, as I've been away on vacation, and I can tell you I could use another three weeks to think about it. I mean, it's, it is something that is really challenging. Went back and forth to quote my preaching professor again, quote, I used to know what I, I used to know what this passage meant, unquote. Used to know what it meant. But the more time you spend with it, the more you begin to study the Word of God, the more that you really look at other passages of scriptures to bring light to that particular passage, to help us interpret and understand it, the more challenging it is. You just go back and forth, back and forth. What is it? Well, we're going to, Lord willing, look at that this morning. I'm looking, and if you look behind me, you'll see that we're planning to go through chapter 12, verse 7. Well, that's a lofty idea. I don't think we're going to get there. Honestly, if we can get through these last two verses of chapter 10 and into chapter 11 to the end of this story of Jephthah, I would really be greatly encouraged by that. But here's what I want to do this morning as we come into this. What I'd like to do is, and rather than read the whole account, what I want to do is read the first part, beginning in chapter 10, there in verses 17 and 18, and we'll read through the introduction that is given to Jephthah. And then we'll come back, and as we walk through the passage, we will read those portions later on. So let's do this. Beginning in chapter 10, in verse number 17, the Word of God says that then the sons of Ammon were summoned, and they camped in Gilead. And the sons of Israel gathered together and camped in Mizpah. The people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the sons of Ammon? He shall become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows gathered themselves about Jephthah. And they went with him. And it came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. And when the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come be our chief that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? 
So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon, and the Lord gives them up to me, I will become your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do this, as you have said. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mitzvah. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, as we come before you, we know that you are great and glorious, and there is none like you. You are the true God, the living God. Indeed, you are the only living and true God. And you are worthy of our worship and adoration. And yet, Lord, we confess that we too, like Israel of old, have pursued idols and false gods. We've ne neglected the good things. Oh, Lord, forgive us. For your namesake, remind us of what you have done for us through your Son. And even as we study this passage that is before us today, Lord, we ask that you would show us Christ. Let us see him on the pages of the Scripture. Help us, Lord, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of him. Grant us understanding of this passage of Scripture through your Holy Spirit. Apply it to our hearts. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. But one of the challenges that comes with studying this passage of Scripture, and the challenge that we've had all through the book of Judges, is that there's a lot of Scripture. There's a lot. When you look at a narrative account, it's much different than going through a letter. We go through a letter. You've got a couple of sections there. You can follow the reasoning. But as we've talked about, in going through a narrative, it's hard to deal with a small section of Scripture because, especially when you're looking at a particular judge, we have to keep in mind all that's there. And so specifically after we had seen Abimelech and the mention of those other leaders that God had risen up after him, we noted last time that in chapter 10, we looked at Israel's dilemma. And we noticed that they had fallen to an all-new depravity. In fact, as the, it is described in those first verses, uh, particularly as you look at uh, the, the section just prior to where we're at, we noticed that there was a sevenfold rebellion. That is to say that they had gone so deep that they were worshiping all kinds of false idols. Seven of them are listed there, the false gods that they were worshiping. In fact, when they come to the Lord, as they've gone in the past, and they ask him to save them, you recall that God says to them something very strong and strange. He says to them, well, well you've, come to, you've come to me. You have these false idols, these false gods. Let them save you. And, of course, the, the follow-up to that is we see not a superficial turn or, or return to the Lord, but you see that they are broken before God. I'm bringing all of this out to say that that passage has a bearing on what we see here. There's a parallel between what you see in that particular passage where essentially they did not want God. They didn't want Him in their midst. They had forgotten all about God. They had rejected Him and pursued the false worship and in the same way, you see that with Jephthah. Jephthah, in that way, is like God, the covenant God of Israel. In that way, we see Jephthah who is rejected. Well, let, let me just um, back up for a moment. 
And let me just mention a, a couple things. I've got, I, I've got really three things that I want to highlight as we walk through this whole section of Scripture. And the first thing I want us to notice is in chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, is, is really, it, it's our shared dilemma that we need to be saved. We need a deliverer. And, and again, this comes out of what we've been looking at in the previous section. They need a deliverer. They've asked God to deliver them. And after true repentance... God could have allowed them to stay in the state that they were in. But go back to verse 16 for a moment. We just got to see this one more time. Verse 16. After they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, notice it says, and he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. So we, we, we see that God is merciful to Israel. And then he raises up a deliverer. So, so as you're looking at verses 17 and 18, you're seeing the aftermath of that, 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 that God is going to show mercy to this people. And so the, the, the leaders are beginning to ask questions. The sons of Ammon were summoned, and they camped at Gilead, and the sons of Israel gathered together, camped at Mizpah. Notice, notice that the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, who is the man who will begin to fight against the sons of Ammon? He shall become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So they're, they're looking, they're asking the question, seeking out who will be their deliverer. They need to be saved. That, that's the dilemma of all of us. We, we need salvation. We need, a, we need a deliverer. We emphasized this last time, and I just want to highlight it one more time, is that certainly we need, as we think about our condition before God, that we are sin, sinners by nature and by choice, we need to be saved. But as I mentioned last time, even saved people, even the covenant people of God, can find themselves in bondage. They've been delivered. They've been set free, but they continue to go back. We can find ourselves back in bondage if we're not careful by pursuing false worship instead of pursuing the true God. And so in that way, we need a deliverer. We need to be rescued. And I, and I feel like I just I need to say this one more time, is that God is merciful. And, and we, we, need, we need to just put this in our heart and in our mind, that God acts because that's who He is. That He is merciful, that He is mercy, that He is compassion. God is love. And so He's loving Certainly God is holy, God is righteous, uh, all of those attributes that we would think about who he is, and, and in accordance with that, he acts. But I want you to know this today, that no matter how bad your week has been, no matter how bad your life has been, that there is a God in heaven that if you will, by faith, call out to him and cry out to him, he will save you, he will deliver you. We need to, we need to know this. Because even for the people of God, we, we find ourselves, we get to a place and we find ourselves in thinking, well, I've I, I messed up. Well, all of us have messed up. But I'm saying, call out to God. That if we are humble, that, 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 that is, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Be mindful that there is a God in heaven. I mean, God, who did not spare his only beloved son, but gave him up as a substitute, as a sacrifice on our behalf. This God loves you. This love that we have is a covenant love. And he's committed to this covenant relationship. And, and I'm saying that he will... Rescue us, no, no matter, and that's what we see in the previous section, that, that even though they deserved, Israel deserved the consequences. They had messed up. They had, they, they had pursued false worship, and, they, and God would have been just and righteous to let them reap what they had sown. But God is merciful. And I'm saying the same for all of us, that he is merciful to us. 
But I want to say this as well, that he is merciful to his people, that he is loving to his people, and that if you are outside of Christ Jesus, then you can know nothing of this love. You can know nothing of this being rescued by God. It is for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if God is for us, then who could be against us? If he didn't spare his only son, how much will he do for his elect? How much, how much does this God love us? Well, God raises up a deliverer. All of us have this shared dilemma that we all need a Savior. We need a Savior not only to save us from our sins, but we, we need a, a Savior. We need a deliverer constantly, continually. We're dependent upon Him to give us the grace to be able to continue and persevere. Notice the one that they go to. We're introduced to him. You see the shared dilemma, but notice the, the, the Savior, the instrument of salvation that God uses there in verses 1 through 11. Something very strange, an individual that we would not expect. We're introduced to him in verse number 1. His name is Jephthah. We're told that he was a, a valiant wa warrior, but notice this, that he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. It's, it's interesting the way that this is worded here. You do see that, that his, he was the son of a harlot, a prostitute. Gilead was his father. The, the, way that it, the, the, the way that it's used, it actually, the language there, it could be that Gilead, that, that Gilead was his father, but really the way that it's, it's worded there, that someone from Gilead was his father. They didn't know. Any man from Gilead could have been his father. And, and you see that as, as the text kind of plays out because the whole town wants to get rid of him. He is despised. This is a despised deliverer. Notice specifically in verse number 2, where Gilead's wife bore him sons. And his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. This makes the argument that it is Gilead's son, but he was born of a harlot. And so the idea is that they, they don't want him to have a share in the inheritance, so they run him out of town. And he flees, verse number 3. In other words, he's rejected by his brothers. And he goes to live in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows gather themselves about Jephthah. He keeps himself in the company of sinners. Boy, he, I mean, do you see this? And they went out with him. And it came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. Verse 5, when the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to him, come be our chief that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Do you see the, the correlation or the parallel to what we've seen earlier in chapter 10? That when Israel finds itself in trouble, the one whom they don't even want in their midst, the one whom they have rejected, they go to him and ask him if he would come and be their chief, their head, and, and fight on their behalf. You get the impression, and you'll see this as we go through this, that Jephthah is a fighter. I mean, he, he is a, he, he's called a valiant warrior, but I mean, this, this is a bad dude. He takes no lip off anybody. We won't get to chapter 12, but you, you can read ahead for that next week. I mean, Je Jephthah does not play. But he also calls them out in verse number 7. He calls out the elders of Gilead. He, he said, did, did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? 
Oh, really? You, you, you want me now? You, you, didn't have any, you didn't want anything to do with me earlier, but you want me now. So why have you come to me now when you're in trouble? Can, can you hear the echo of the Lord in that? I mean, why is, it, why, why is it that some of you, that the only time that you seek the Lord and that you come looking to God is when you're in trouble? Well, why is that? What, why is it that that's the only time that you really desire to have anything to do with God? Jephthah is asking that question of the elders. Why have you come here now that you're in trouble? And the elder said, for this reason. This is why we've returned to you that, you, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over the, all the inhabitants of Gilead. And, and that appeals to Jephthah. So, so he wants to know that we, if this is so. If the Lord gives them up to me. We're told something about Jephthah right there. He, he knows that the battle belongs to the Lord, that victory belongs to God. And so verse number 10, the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. And so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mitzvah. So in this, you see these parallels. You see the, 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 the scandalous conception that certainly relates to our Lord Jesus, who was born of a virgin, and, and, it, and it was somewhat of a scandal that the Pharisees were always questioning, the teachers of the law, they were always questioning, is, is this Mary's son, Mary's boy, as opposed to identifying him with a father, that it was somewhat scandalous that he was born of a virgin. He kept the company of, of sinners as we saw that Jephthah hung out with a band of gangsters, a rough crowd there. But then you see something going into the next session that also parallels the Lord, and that is that the wisdom that Jephthah has. Now, some people emphasize this next section beginning in verse 12 as negotiation skills. But really, what we see in this is the wisdom of God, that he's using the Scriptures as a way to confront the king about the battle that he is desiring, the fight, the war that he desires to have with Israel. And so if you look at the story, in fact, uh, you'll see the premise is there in verse number 12 is where we begin. It says that Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the sons of Ammon, saying, what is between you and me that you have come to fight against my land? There, there's this going back and forth with Jephthah and the king, messengers going back and forth. And Jephthah is sending word to the king. He, he wants to send word to him, asking the question, what is this between? But notice the premise there in verse number 14. You'll, you'll notice that he says that Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the sons of Ammon. Excuse me, let's go back to verse 13. So the king says, because Israel took away my land when they came up from Egypt. And Jephthah says in verse 14, as he sends those messengers, verse 15, Israel did not take away the land, Moab, nor the land of the sons of Ammon. This is the premise. By the way, if you're in school and you're writing a paper, you'll notice that he gives a a thesis at the beginning of this, and then at the end, he gives a conclusion. And then he gives three arguments in the middle of this. What is his conclusion? Well, the conclusion is, looking to the end of verse number 28 there, verse 27, He says, I therefore have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the judge, 
judged today between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon, but the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent. So he starts with the premise that, no, we've not done wrong. And that's his concluding statement as well. And then he gives three arguments. I, I'm not going to take time to go through all of this in detail, but I, I just want to highlight there for you in verses 16 through 22, he does a historical argument. He goes back and argues how Moses and his people had asked the Ammonites for safe passage through the territory. And, and the Ammonites would not grant them what they had asked for. And so this led to war. God gives Israel the victory, so Israel didn't steal the land. And furthermore, the Amorites had originally taken the land from the Moabites, so if Israel's claim to ownership by conquest wasn't valid, well, neither were the claims of the Amorites. He gives a historical, then he gives a theological in verses 23 and 24, that it was the Lord had given them the land. Again, Jephthah's always careful to give the Lord the glory. And so he makes this argument that it's the Lord who had done that. And then he gives a, a legal precedent in verses 25 through 26. Let's just look at that. He says, now are you any better than the Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive with Israel? Or did he ever fight against them while Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages and Eror and its villages and all the cities that are on the banks of Arnon, 300 years, why do you recover them with that time? In other words, why, why, why now? I mean, why are you waiting to now to do this? 300 years have gone by. What has changed? He gives a historical argument about the way that the land was given to him. He gives a theological that it is Yahweh, it is the Lord who has given them that land. And then he makes the president, this is, this is the way it's always been, so why now? It's interesting because there is a parallel here as I was studying this. I, I, it made me think about Matthew 12 where we see the Lord Jesus dealing with those Pharisees and teachers of the law. That he, In that, he's dealing with them about the Sabbath. And he does the same thing. He gives a historical reference to David and how David partook on the Sabbath, he gives a theological about the priest would eat on the Sabbath, and then he gives his conclusion. So there's parallels in that. I'm bringing all this out to say that there's parallels between Jephthah and the Lord Jesus. What is all this about? What is he doing? What, what, is, what is God teaching us through this passage of Scripture? Well, one of the things he's teaching us, and Jephthah, who was born on the wrong side of the tracks, and Jephthah, who on the surface, there's nothing in him or about him that makes him look like he would be the right kind of deliverer. And when the Lord Jesus walked on the face of this earth, there was nothing about him that drew people to him to say that this is God in the flesh. Other than his words. And his miracles. But they didn't see him from the surface. They didn't see the circumstances that he was born in. As this is God's Messiah. And the point being is that God can use any instrument to accomplish his purposes. God can use us. We've noted this before in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is that God has chosen the foolish things of this world. Not many of us, we know in that passage as we read that, not, not many of us were of noble character. Not, not many of us have, are, are, are the, the select among the culture, but God uses us. And that brings us to the last section. And we see in this last section... The cost of victory. It's very costly. I want us to read through it, and I'm looking at the time and thinking, I've already set the table, and I have to go ahead and walk through this, so I can't just stop here. But I, I want you to notice, beginning in verse number 29, let's read this section, 
We'll make a, a few comments, and then Lord willing, we'll come back to this next time. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Then he passed through Mitzvah of Gilead, and from Mitzvah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's. And here it is, and I will offer it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them with a very great slaughter from Haror to the entrance of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel, Karamim. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. And when Jephthah came to the house of Mizpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet with him, tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. And you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged you, of your enemies, the sons of Ammon. And she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone ten, two months that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity. I and my companions. And then he said, go. So he went away. So he sent her away for two months and she left with her companions and wept on the mountains because of her virginity. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did to her according to the vow which he had made, and she had no relations with a man. Thus it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. Costly vow. What's going on here? I mean, if we take it right on the surface, which we have to do, I mean, we come and approach this passage of Scripture, it definitely looks like to our eyes that Jephthah has made a quick and rash vow, that he has done something very foolish. In fact, that's how most commentators come at this passage. And in fact, as, as comment, well, they come from different directions, but for the most part, they come at this passage and they criticized Jephthah for making such a foolish and rash vow. And the commentary is, goes something like this, that Jephthah, who has shown his negotiation skills, as we've seen in the previous section, and he, he makes his three arguments, he's, he's got a premise, he's got a conclusion, that Jephthah here is trying to negotiate with God, that if you will do this for me, then I will do that. And that's the way it's presented. And in fact, it's presented in that way, in such a way that we can't help it, if you've heard a message on this, or if you've read anything about this, you can't help but to see this passage in that way. But it does bring up some questions. Is that what really happened? Is it that Jephthah, who makes this vow, that whatever comes through the doors of my house that I'm going to offer as a burnt offering, did he offer his daughter as a burnt offering? Well, that's all the time we have for the... No, no, I'm just kidding. So what, 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 what are we to make of it? Well, no, number one, I think as you, as you look at this passage, you have to look at it in light of all of Scripture, and we know that nowhere else do we see a burnt offering, the only, the only time that we see someone who is offered as a sacrifice to the Lord outside of the Lord Jesus Christ is when 
God tells Abraham to take his only son, Isaac. And in that way, that's the only time you see God is the one who is orchestrating that. And of course, he prevents, he sends the angel and prevents Abraham from taking Isaac's life. So you don't, you, you don't see anywhere else in Scripture where God is pleased in doing this. And I say that to say that there are occasions where you see, for example, with Saul in 1 Samuel, in chapter 14, you, you see the account where in 15 of 1 Samuel, you see the account where Samuel, who has made this, uh, when Israel is in battle, has made this uh, promise that if anybody who eats that particular day puts anything to their mouth, that they are cursed. And Jonathan, who had not heard about that, you remember the story, Jonathan eats some honey, and when it's pointed out to Saul what he has done, you recall the story that he was going to have him put to death, but all of those around him would not let it happen. And I bring that out to say that I would think the same thing would happen, that this was a sacrifice, a burnt offering to the Lord. I would think that there would be those around that would not, the priest who would not let this happen, allow this. I would point to this, that before we see the vow, notice going back to verse number 29, that you see that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. The timing of that says something about what Jephthah is doing. This is not the only place where we see something like this where Jephthah makes a vow to the Lord. We see that with Jacob, for example, where he makes a vow that if God would do something, that he would do something in return. Some have suggested that Jephthah did not expect his daughter to come through the door. I think that's very clear from the text. Some have argued that he may have thought that maybe it would be an animal, not necessarily a cat or a dog, but maybe a, a, a goat or a sheep. But there's nothing that would suggest that. In fact, the text makes it very clear that he's not talking about an animal because he talks about this person, this one who's coming to him, that when they meet me, I don't know of dogs or cow. I wouldn't know of a cow or a, a donkey or something like that coming up to, to meet us and greet us because of the victory that's been won. He's expecting someone. And it seems to be he's probably expecting one of his servants. It, it's not, as we see, his daughter is dancing there, she's celebrating. It's not uncommon that after a victory has been given to Israel, even you see this with Miriam and those women after the victory of Moses, that they were dancing. The tambourines, all of that is not something that would be uncommon. But it's probably that he was expecting a servant that would come out. There are conditions... And the question is always brought up as you look at Leviticus chapter 27. There are ways to get out of a vow. We know that our yes is to be yes and our no is to be no. And that when we make vows, that we are to keep those vows before the Lord. God holds every word that we say. He, he, we're, we're accountable for all of our speech. Leviticus chapter 27 makes it clear in that whole passage, that if we do make a vow, there is a way out. We can get out of a vow. For example, a monetary substitute. We see in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 4, where a woman was to be redeemed for 30 shekels of silver. There are, If we make a vow, there are ways out of that. 
So why did he not do this? And some have suggested that he was so influenced by the culture and that it was not uncommon for the Canaanites to offer false worship and that they would sacrifice people, that he's so in, influenced by the culture that he does that which God does not command and which God does not, is not pleased. But I don't think that's what's going on here. Why did he not get out of this? Why, why did he not get out of the vow? And I, and I would show you, if you want to look at Leviticus chapter 27, real quickly, we'll make this reference, and then we'll bring this to a close. Leviticus chapter 27. Look at verses 28 and 29. And he says this, Nevertheless, anything which a man sets apart to the Lord, out of all that he has of man or animal or of the fields of his own property shall not be sold or redeemed. Anything devoted to destruction is most holy to the Lord. No one who may have been set apart among men shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put to death. What is he saying? Those things that are devoted. The word that he used here for devoted is translated as burnt offering. Is the same word we saw in chapter 1 of the book of Judges that... that that this burnt off, this thing that was sacrificed to the Lord, the, the word that he used there speaks of devoted to the Lord, that this was set apart to the Lord. So there's no getting out of that. There's no getting out of this vow. This was set apart for the Lord. His daughter was set apart for the Lord. Just very quickly, as you look at the end of this passage, it seems to be that it's not death that she is mourning. It doesn't say that she mourned for two months because she only had two months to live. Notice verse 34. When he sees his daughter coming out, the emphasis is on that she was his one and only child. He, she is his progeny. He, the, the, the line, the lineage is carried on with her. And besides her, he had no son or daughter. He tears his clothes. Alas, my daughter, you brought me very low. You troubled me. We see that. And then verse 36, she says, you've given your word to the Lord. You've devoted me to the Lord. You, you, you have to do what you've said. Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity. Again, it's because of her virginity. It seems to be that what is lost there is the lineage. What's lost there is that they're looking back to what we saw, Jephthah, Jephthah who has made the head, he cannot establish a house. He cannot have a kingdom. It's as if God is saying to Jephthah and to Israel that I'm not going to build my kingdom through you. It's not going to happen. Something else I would think that points to that this is not death, but rather she is consecrated. She's given to the Lord. We know that women served in the tabernacle. We, we see that even in 1 Samuel, that women served the tabernacle. So at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did to her according to the vow which he had made. And she, there it is again, and she had no relations with a man. The emphasis seems to be that she will not marry. Thus it became a custom in Israel. That the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. In other words, they remember. This word to commemorate makes it sound like a death. But really, the way it's, 
in, in the original language, it's they revisited it. And it seems to be that every year they revisited this event. And I believe that they revisited with her and what she had done. And the loss of her having a family. It was it a sad thing that she was given and set apart for the work of the Lord? No. I mean, in, in some respect, it's not a sad thing. But it is sad in the sense that Jephthah, who obviously desires to be a head, desires to be a leader, desires to establish his house and be a ruler in Israel, for him it was sad because it was the end. There would be none of that. And the house of God would be established through David. That through David, that there is an everlasting kingdom. That the Lord Jesus Christ would be the descendant of David, the son of David, who God would establish an eternal house, an everlasting kingdom. And even today, we know that Jesus is ruling and reigning. The question for us is, are you a member of his house? The question for us is, are we in the house? Are we in Christ Jesus, or are we still outside of the house? I'll ask if you will stand with me for prayer. Lord willing, we'll come back next week and make a few other remarks, but I want to get into chapter 12 and those first seven verses. But I'll end where I began, and that is to remind us that we all need a Savior. We all need a Deliverer. We all do. And if you are not a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have not trusted in Him, and maybe you would say, you know, I, I don't understand that. I, I, then I would say, pray and ask God that He would give you a heart of understanding, a mind to understand your need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then for the rest of us who are in Christ Jesus, I will remind you that this one who, whom, Christ, or whom God has established this everlasting kingdom, that He is building His house and that we are part of His house. If indeed we are in Christ Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you for this teaching. I pray, Lord, as we examine our, our own hearts before you, that we would seek to, to apply these truths to our heart. Lord, we would check ourselves to see if we are truly of the faith. And Lord, that we would be mindful of how when we pursue the false things of this world, false worship, the pleasures and pride of life, when we pursue those things that we are truly rebelling against you. Help us, O oh Lord, deliver us from those things. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.